<laughs> and now to the main event for the evening, uh, the presentation by Brad Templeton on robocars and their implications. What I've come to talk to you about is a technology that I believe is going to change uh, the world more so than most uh, computer technologies will have the opportunity to in the next uh, 10 years. And this is, as was suggested, cars that are actually able to drive themselves. I think we've got a little too much level. I'm hearing a bit of distortion. I don't know if you can adjust that, Larry. Um, cars that are able to adjust themselves, to drive themselves. Now, I'm going to talk to you about five big changes which can come to the world as a result of this, and then tell you a little bit about how it works, what's coming, what's coming from Google and from some other companies. Now, as a consultant to Google, I'm not a spokesman for them, so you can't go into the press tomorrow and say that Google said this or that. This is based on my own research and study into the field um, about where I think it's going. But as was pointed out, the first thing we're going to talk is the ability to save lives. And this would actually be enough for most people. But we're also going to talk about the energy consequences, which are remarkable, and also some of the consequences to cities. In particular, how much of our cities we've given over to parking, uh, how much of our lives we give over to traffic. And then finally, the concept of automated delivery. Because once you have a vehicle that can drive itself, you also have something that can deliver something autonomously as well. So let's begin, though, with saving lives. And the problem there, of course, is human drivers. Human drivers are not particularly good. Uh, in fact, they kill, in the United States, 34,000 people every year on the highways and around 1.2 billion around the world. This number's actually been dropping for a variety of reasons, but it's still a staggering number, more, more than many of the major diseases, more than any other uh, thing besides heart disease and cancer in terms of taking years of life away from people because it kills people when they're young. Um, there are 12 million accidents in the United States every year, and there are about uh, 1.8 million of them causing injuries, so in addition to the deaths, there's a lot of sometimes very serious injuries and maimings. The National Highway Transportation Safety Agency here in Washington calculated that the cost of accidents, when they did this about five or six years ago, was $230 billion in the United States, which was about 2.5% of the GDP. Interestingly enough, if you put that out in terms of per mile, it was eight cents a mile, and before gasoline soared up, as it has in the last few years, this was actually more expensive than gasoline for a number of people. The cost of accidents was more expensive than the gasoline or the depreciation on the car or the insurance or all these other major components. And if you think about it as well, we also spend about 50 billion hours every year doing this. Not really the most productive thing we could be doing with 50 billion hours. And because of that, that's about 8% of the GDP. Now, 40% of those fatalities turn to involve alcohol. Uh, robots are pretty good about not drinking if you tell them not to drink. 80% of those accidents are just due to plain inattention. They're just someone wasn't looking. Another thing that computers are very good at. So we lose about 41 hours uh, a year to congestion. And we have also, as I mentioned, given up so much of our cities to parking. There are between three and eight parking spaces for every car in the United States. And there are estimates that have suggested that 60% of the land in the city of Los Angeles, and admittedly it's an outlier here, uh, but nonetheless, 60% of the land in Los Angeles is roads, driveways, garages, parking lots, all of this land that's been devoted to the car. We also let the car consume 25% of our energy budget and a similar amount of our CO2 output is a result of the car, not just the gasoline we burn, but also the energy in making them. Now, the truth is that many people have thought this idea of a car that drives itself is one from science fiction. And the reality is that they are coming, and they are coming sooner than you think. And that's because this is what I like to call garage innovation. It's happening from the bottom up, and it's not building a computer that can think like a human being and have a conversation with you. This is the intelligence, perhaps, of a horse, or perhaps even less. Perhaps it's the intelligence of a bug, because bugs can swarm and not hit each other, travel down channels. So it's not the challenge that some people thought it was. It's not making something that's as smart as a human being. So at Google, the team has put together a remarkable vehicle. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of what's happened and why it happened. It began with contests that were sponsored by the military, DARPA, in the United States. And I believe you actually had a speaker here a few years ago who was one of the organizers of those contests. So you'll know perhaps a little bit of this first little bit in this film that we're going to see. The first contest was a complete failure. Nobody got more than seven miles, and it was to race in the desert. And there were all sorts of unusual entrants, ranging from military-sized vehicles to my friend Anthony, who forgot to turn on a circuit in his motorcycle. But by the second contest, 
five different cars were able to complete that 150-mile course in the desert. Here we see Stanford's car, uh, which was known as Stanley, which was, able, which was the winner of this contest, doing things like driving down a mountain ravine, and this is in 2005 that we're seeing this happen, uh, and then racing after 150 miles to the finish line with no one inside of it. Well, Google took the winners of this contest and a later contest to drive on city streets and built a team to build the next generation of vehicle. Here we see Chris pushing the button and the vehicle driving down ordinary streets with traffic and with other people. We see it coming to a stop at a light, making a left turn, avoiding pedestrians in the intersection. We thank these people for participating in our research, by the way. <laughs> this is how the computer sees. I'm going to show you a little bit more about this. In 360 degrees at all times, seeing everything that's around it, identifying everything, being able to deal with pedestrians and dogs, busy city streets here in San Francisco with people stopped at left turns and traffic lights, going past joggers at stop signs, um, going through the toll booths on the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, this is sped up a little bit. Driving down the coastal road, this is Monterey in California. Some of you may have been there. Um, driving day or night or on mountain roads, for example, with things that frankly would scare human drivers a lot of the time. Uh, as I said, it sees exactly the same day or night, and, and those are not an issue. We even took the car, if you've been to San Francisco, down one of its most famous streets, the windiest street in the world, Lombard Street. Now, the car has also been programmed to be able to do uh, slightly scarier things like merging into a highway intersection. Uh, and at Stanford, uh, we'll show a little clip of them programming how you should not park a car. Uh, but it was able to do that. So this is the state of the, actually this is the state of the art about a year ago, and I'm going to show you a little more of the state of the art by telling you that not just Google but many other companies are working on this. And you've probably already seen cars that you can buy today that will do parallel parking on their own. Um, there are cars that can keep you in your lane and warn you if you're departing the lane. Um, many of you may even have an automatic cruise control, which is able to maintain the distance from the vehicle in front of you. There are cars that spot pedestrians and will beep at you if you're about to hit one and even hit the brakes if you're going to hit a pedestrian or another vehicle. All of these things are in cars you can buy now. And the car companies are working on a number of systems which they've announced will be coming out very soon. In particular, this year you'll be able to buy a 2013 Mercedes, but that comes out in 2012. This year you'll be able to buy the Mercedes S-Class with a slow autopilot meant for use in traffic jams. So it will be able to follow the car in front of you and keep itself in the lane when you're in a traffic jam under 25 miles an hour. Volkswagen has announced a similar technology, but at highway speed, which they think they might get out in about 2016. Uh, Cadillac, actually, I need to put this one in, has just announced a, um, what they call a super cruise, which will also do this in the highway, and they've announced that that should come in about 2015. We've also seen projects from the Japanese companies with cars that will do things like valet parking in a parking lot. There's a Toyota Prius with a system called Avos that Toyota has put out, which is to be able to do that and do some highway driving. So there are many, many different companies working on it. Now, uh, actually, let me just pause this for a second uh, and go back. Um, the uh, Google released this video, and some of you may have seen it already, just uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I want to tell you about the vision of the future, and this is a video that shows a vision of the future. And this is of a vehicle that you can, for example, summon with a cell phone, and it comes up right to the door of your house or the club, and you get into it, and it takes you to where you want to go in a very comfortable environment where you're not paying any attention to driving. If there's someone with you, you may be sitting face to face. You might be working or reading or watching a video. A very different experience from today's driving. So we wanted to make a demonstration of that world, and uh, I, I'm going to go back and play a video then. Hopefully we'll get the audio on there. We are, great. This man's not a Google employee. He was uh, brought in to sort of be a test subject for that. Good morning, Steve. Hey, Nathaniel, how are you? Doing just great. Can you hear this? Go ahead, Steve. Auto driving. Look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. No hands, no feet. No nothing. <laughs> I love it. So we're here at the stop sign. Yep. The car's using radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming either way. I find myself looking. <laughs> Old habits die hard, man. Hey, hey, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want? What do you want to do today, Steve? I'm I'm all for tacos though myself. All right. Well, I wish he'd pick something better. Now we're turning into the parking lot. How many? Here we go. 
show. Now they kind of creep along here. Does anybody have any money? I've got money. No, I've got my wallet right here. <laughs> you roll down your window and order a burrito. Yeah, push that up. I'm doing very well. How are you today? This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Ninety-five percent of my vision is is gone. I'm well past legally blind. You lose your timing in life. Everything takes you much longer. There are some places that you cannot go. There are some things that you really cannot do. Where this would change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go when I need to do those things. Places I have to go. So Steve was, of course, uh, I guess you can turn that game down again. Steve was, uh, of course, upset that uh, when we took the car away from him, he's the head of the Santa Clara Valley Blind Center. And uh, as you can see, there are consequences not just for ordinary people getting back time and productivity and so on, but there are a number of people who can't move at all. They don't have mobility in the world uh, because of disabilities, and a number of people who are losing those abilities as they get older. Um, or to losing them to diseases. And so this will also provide transportation to that group of people once they're successful. So this is a story of how programmers can save the world. Let's talk about a little bit about the technology. The system that made all this possible, both in the DARPA Urban Challenge that you heard about and this car, is a system called LIDAR, which is basically a laser radar. It's the ability to send out light pulses in time, how long they take to return, and know how far away the thing you bounce the light off is. This provides a 3D picture of the world around you. It's not, uh, you don't have to, for example, look at a picture and pull out the images and say, oh, that's a dog, or that's a person, or that's a car. You get a 3D view so you know when something is in front of you and not far away. It allows a very simple algorithm to work. If something's in front of you, don't run over it. Um, it is a little simpler, a little more complex than that, I mean. There is more you have to do but it does pr allow for the safety level that you want for a technology like this. This particular sensor we see here has 64 lasers in it, and it spins around 10 times every second, scanning the world. It's very expensive. It's what you'd find in a prototype vehicle, but thanks to uh, a couple of our friends, one of which is Moore's Law, and the other of which is making things in volume, these sensors will become cheap. Now, it's not the only sensor on the vehicle, though. Um, actually, let me show you a little bit about the LiDAR, sorry, I was gonna mention. So here's a short video showing you how the car is first scanning the world in 360 degrees in 3D, and then classifying everything. You see the boxes it draws around the cars, the objects on the side of the road. And it's able to know exactly where it is because it knows the road. It's driven the road before. It knows exactly, or, or a cousin of it has, it knows exactly where it is. It knows where everything is, what everything is doing, and it's able to use that to pick where it's going to go, drive safely, and not hit things. So also on board is a radar. Uh, you can sort of see the radar at the front next to the license plate. Radar is, has longer range than the laser. It tells you the speed of things, which is very useful. It can actually see cars in front of the car that's in front of you, so that even if your view is being blocked, the radar can see that. And that's very useful. Now, you also see uh, a better odometer, and that just helps us get our position a little bit better. And again, in a prototype, it looks like this, obviously. In the future, it won't be something nearly as visible. And finally, one sensor which you, most people think is very important to this technology, it turns out not to be quite as important as you'd imagine, and that's the GPS. There's the GPS antenna on the vehicle. And it doesn't use the GPS to drive any more than a human being uses the GPS to drive. It uses the GPS to know roughly where it is, so that it can then identify exactly where it is. So if it goes through a tunnel and the GPS goes out, it can still drive. That's kind of a useful ability. Uh, finally, there is a camera in the system, and again, unlike a human, it barely uses this camera. This camera is there to see things that only a camera can see, like traffic lights and turn signals and so on. Um, it doesn't use the camera to drive. The vehicle doesn't see like a human and doesn't drive like a human. 
And that's one of the most important realizations that's been true in every successful AI project. The world chess champion is now a computer, but it does not play chess the way that people, it doesn't think about chess the way that people do. And neither does this car drive like that. So what does it mean to have this mobility on demand, this uh, pleasant work environment I talk about, this ability to do it all, and in particular do it all with no central control and no new infrastructure. These cars, like you, don't talk to other cars on the road. Well, some people talk to other cars. Um, <laughs> but there's no official communications protocol. Um, it's easy the other cars can react with them. This is what can bring a revolution, and I'll explain why. First, though, I want to talk to you about energy. Now, the reason that I have found that this might have such a profound effect on energy, and the life-saving, again, should be more than enough for anyone trying to decide if this is a good thing for the world, is that this allows us to treat vehicles in a very different way. The vehicle that you can summon on demand means that you can travel in what I call the right vehicle for the trip. Now, today, most trips are short trips with one person across town. We almost always make them in five-passenger sedans or sometimes SUVs and minivans and larger vehicles. But in fact, if you could make the short one-person trips in a vehicle designed for a short one-person trip, and the longer four-person trips in a vehicle designed for that, it has remarkable consequences to how much energy transportation takes. You can now, instead of buying a car that does everything you need, and how many of you who own cars have got five-passenger sedans or bigger? Right? I don't think only one person in this room has a five-passenger sedan. <laughs> The truth is everyone has one of those. Very few people have as their primary mode of transportation a, a, a single scooter or occasionally they have a motorcycle. Uh, many people have something larger. Because we buy the vehicle that meets all of our needs. If we think we're going to go skiing a couple times a year, we get an SUV. If we think we're going to hargo, haul cargo uh, once or twice a year, we get a pickup truck. We don't need to do that. We might not even buy vehicles at all. This turns out to produce something that's even greener than transit. If you look at this vehicle that I've shown a picture of, it's not necessarily what everyone would ride in. But this vehicle, which is a very simple one-person vehicle with three wheels, it isn't one that would go on the highway, it isn't one that would um, necessarily be used for anything but a short trip because it wouldn't have long range. It's actually incredibly efficient. I started looking at how much energy we use for transportation in all the different systems that we have in the United States and other countries of the world. And I was shocked to learn that the tra even the transit systems that are used are no more efficient than the cars. The blue one in the middle is an average car. The average car has one and a half people in it, presumably one in the driver's seat and half in the trunk. Um, <laughs> and that takes this wonderful unit, about 3,600 BTUs per passenger mile. The BTU is the British thermal unit, which is, of course, used only in the United States. Um, <laughs> but this is actually the inverse of miles per gallon, so uh, you know, that, that a lower number is better, is more efficient here, unlike with miles per gallon, where a higher number is better. Uh, and the United States Department of Energy publishes what these numbers are for all the different modes of transportation. And what you may be surprised to find is that the typical city bus, which has on average nine passengers in the United States, is over 4,000. The city buses use more fuel per person than the cars do in the United States. Now, that's cars, the light trucks and SUVs and so on are in a separate occasion, and you can see them up higher with a bigger number. Um, the light rail systems are tre tremendously bad. There's one ridiculous light rail system in Galveston and a few other cities um, that uses in the order of what is a 34,000 BTUs per passenger mile. It's, you, you could give every passenger their own Prius and you'd have uh, been far better for the world. You may be curious to see that there are things that are definitely better like some of the electric cars and hybrid cars. The subway in New York and also the, the subway here in, uh, in um, Washington, D.C. are in at about 2,500, which means they're better than the average car, but they're not actually better, for example, than a highly efficient car or an electric car. Um, that's because while you see that subway mostly full of people and packed up, there's also all the times it's running when it isn't packed with people. And there's the time the reverse commute rides and the end of the line when there are just a few people who are going to the end of the line. But you can't build a transit system if you don't go to the end of the line, if you don't run all the time. So you end up building a system which uses more energy than you'd expect. Now, there are people who do better. You can see here East Japanese uh, Rail, for example, the East Japan Rail System, which comes in at just over 1,000, is better than the typical cars. But it's not, none of them are as good as that little, tiny, scooter-like vehicle that I showed you which comes in between three to 500 BTUs per passenger mile. If we go to a world where we make most urban trips that way, it's a tremendous saving of energy that's possible. And I think this is the answer to the question, in a way, of who killed the electric car. Now, it's not the answer you'll find in that movie, 
Um, they don't think the battery was the culprit. They, they think that people's attitudes about the battery were one of the big culprits, and of course a lot of, of uh, corporate players as well. But it is true that people have resisted buying electric cars because they don't like the cost of the battery, they don't like the range that they're afraid of, they don't like that long recharge time and, and worrying about having been stuck and needing to recharge. We've actually known how to make a short-range, efficient electric car for 100 years. In fact, the very first cars that were sold were actually electric cars of this type. That's not a brand new technology. What we don't know is how to make people buy it. This is actually all about marking. But the truth is, you see, that robots are very nice. They don't care about how convenient it is to refuel or recharge. Robots don't care about anything. Um, they don't care about waiting. They also don't park, but they can wait, what you might call standing legally, in all that. And this enables alternative energy and alternative fuels in a way that nothing has with human beings. So the problem is gasoline has a hundred year head start on any other kind of transportation energy you'd like to think of. Gasoline's been building infrastructure, putting stations everywhere. It's a very dense fuel, it's got all these advantages, and it's very hard to compete with it. If you want to come up with some brand new alternative fuel, say you love hydrogen, I'm not a big fan of it, but some people do, or you have another fuel, or electricity itself, the problem is that you could say, well, great, I'll buy this vehicle that needs a new fuel, where can I fill it up? And people will say, well, not really very many places. And they'll say, okay, fine, I'll start a business setting up fueling stations for the new fuel. How many cars are there going to come into my fueling station? Well, not that many. It's the classic chicken and egg problem of business. But when you have a vehicle which can go and refuel itself, which is something these vehicles will be eventually able to do, you have the ability to start up without building a big fuel infrastructure because they can travel to the infrastructure instead of requiring humans to take that trip. So I believe that the robocar can save the electric car, and if we did get, admittedly, a little bit further in the future, a replacement of most of our urban trips with efficient transportation, that removes 200 million tons of CO2 and stops the United States from importing oil from overseas anymore. It still imports it from Canada. I'm Canadian, so I would never want to stop that. <laughs> but it could mean a dramatic difference. If you think about what the United States has gone through in order to import all this oil from overseas, you might even think this is a more dramatic cost than that. Now, let's talk about some of the policy issues. And when I first began talking about this, I gave a lot of thought to worrying about the law and whether the governments would ban it. But something instead has happened that's quite remarkable, which is the governments have been embracing it. And just on Monday, uh, the state of Nevada, which passed a law to enable electric cars, gave our Google team uh, the first license plate for an autonomous car. And you can see it there. It has an infinity symbol on it. That may be a bit ambitious. <laughs> but they meant to use it as a symbol of the future, and we have, we have plate number one. So it has become legal in the state of Nevada to first test and eventually to operate these vehicles. There are similar laws being proposed in California, in Florida, in Oklahoma, and in Hawaii. And many other states are considering it. The federal government is also uh, very enthused about the technology and has been uh, quite positive in its view towards regulation. They understand that a technology that can save lives at this level is not a technology to be slowed down. Because every year we delay a technology that can save as many lives this is another year that 34,000 people die. That's, that's not a minor number. I mean, you compare that to so many other things in life, it's an immense number which we've sort of become blind to. But even so, even if there are jurisdictions that resist it, I believe this will happen because jurisdictions will compete. Um, if one city does not want to have robot cars or one state does not want to have them, another state will come forward and say, you know what, we think we'd like to lead the world in this new technology in robotics. We don't want um, to be behind. And so if jurisdictions compete, you get Singapore, for example, where they can change liability very quickly. You can get China, where the same is true. India, where they have a lot of high-tech development. Israel, Japan. There are many countries where this technology might be pushed forward. In addition, we have a number of people who will lobby for it. I talked about people who are disabled, uh, also, and people who were losing driving ability due to age. There's also people with children who would eventually like to get their lives back. 75% um, of children are now driven to school even though they live uh, 10 feet from the school. Um, it's, I don't know why this happened. You know, uh, uh, by the way, we should all welcome my mother who has uh, uh, flown down on her private airline tonight to come and see this talk. Um, she never drove me anywhere. But anyway, other people who will lobby for it will be uh, drunks who want to get wasted and the Mothers Against Drunk Driving, together with the drunks for the first time ever, because 
they want to see, they want to see drunk driving end, as everyone does. And finally, of course, Jews, and the reason for this is that um, there's nothing Jews will love more than arguing about whether it's legal to ride in this car on Saturday or not. <laughs> but nothing is perfect, right? There are going to be downsides to this. It's, it's not out of the question we could generate the Wall-E world where we're all carried around on floating carpets and find ourselves walking in very few places, and that could be bad for us. We could see people, instead of living in dense cities and um, enjoying the very rapid ability to move anywhere in the city and, 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 and meet anybody, might in fact increase our sprawl and take longer trips and longer commutes because these commutes are now more pleasant. They're not lost time anymore. Their time where you read or you walk or you, sp or, or not, or you work or you spend time with your family. Um, so we could in fact see super sprawl. Many people uh, believe that the car is the technology that changed the landscape, changed the city and created the suburb and the way that cities exist today in the United States. Um, this is going to be another change of that magnitude as to how cities survive. I've imagined people going completely the reverse of the lovely little uh, you know, three-wheeled scooter that I showed you and building not just a robo RV, but a fleet of RVs that follows them everywhere they go and docks and forms a house, um, <laughs> no matter where you stop. Now, that's really cool, isn't it? <laughs> but it's certainly not green. Uh, and it's an interesting challenge as to how people, people always find a way to do things with technologies that, that you didn't imagine or to compensate for the good that you give them. Um, you may not know this, but in the past 30 years, automotive engineers, very skilled people, have made gasoline uh, internal combustion engines 25% more efficient than they were in, that, uh, in the 80s. And you know what the average fleet miles per gallon did during the period they made the vehicles 30% more efficient? It went up. Uh, or sorry, it went down like one mile per gallon. It went down to 20 because people just started buying bigger and heavier cars for these, with these efficient engines. So there are ways that things can definitely go wrong. Many people ask me, I'm sure you're already wondering, you know, my own computer gets infected with uh, viruses. In fact, uh, uh, about 30% of all PCs uh, in, the, in the world are infected in part of what's called a botnet, if you've heard of this term before. These are networks of t computers that have been taken over for nefarious purposes. By the way, that means that if you look to the person on your left and the person on your right, and if it's neither one of them, it's you. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, these are not going to be PCs. We don't design them that way, but this is possible. We have to source all the electricity if we really do receive this, this change to electricity I talked about. It's going to disrupt a lot of industries, not just the car industry, which is going to have to scramble to adapt and deal with the new ways that people buy and use cars. It's also going to, have to, it's going to disrupt, obviously, all the industries that are involved in driving. You know, taxi drivers are going to have to find other sources of income. The Teamsters will probably eventually be our enemy, and they're a very polite enemy, so that's okay. Um, there are going to be empty cars running around, which isn't very efficient. And the military um, started their contests to build these technology because they wanted robots that could deliver material and, uh, and, and various cargo in war zones without having to risk soldiers. Because right now, one of the biggest dangers they have is they... Oops, we got a screensaver there. Um, the biggest danger that they have is uh, uh, they send out just an, an ordinary cargo fleet and there's a roadside bomb and it kills a soldier, comes home in a box, that's really bad. So they wanted that, but the truth is when they get this level of technology, they're also going to use it to make killer robots. And nobody's really happy about that, but it is something that's going to happen. Let's see if we mucked up our... Uh, okay, I guess we... Yeah, oh, there, we're, I think we're alive here. Yes, okay. It just program gets confused. So let's talk about privacy. As it was mentioned, I'm uh, on the board of, and I was chairman for 10 years, of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. How many of you of know of the EFF, at least to some extent, I hope? Okay, I'm glad you do. Um, so we are an organization that works for free speech and privacy rights and civil rights and so on. Um, so no surprise that I worry about this when we think about this. We're going to build vehicles with cameras on them and sensors that are driving everywhere. So we're going to end up putting sensors all over the world in something that we've been fighting. Um, and they're going to always be recording, at least in the beginning, because we want to test them. Uh, in fact, the laws that have been passed in places like the state of Nevada require them to keep a log for the 30 seconds prior to any collision. Um, so hopefully they won't log longer for people who have privacy concerns, but that minimal logging is required there. And I believe that your own technology should not betray you, but there are other people who think differently, and some of them are called police. Um, it's true that our cell phones already do do this. They already are tracking, and you probably know that um, Sprint revealed that they had received 8 million requests for people, locations of people's cell phones last year. It's not something that's going on on the small scale. But nonetheless, let's not make it worse with what we do this. 
And it's also going to be a problem if we move to more rental vehicles. Many people have said to me, when I talk about this, I can't see why anyone would own a car anymore if you can just punch a button on your phone and, and a, a, a taxi runs up to the, the door where you are. There are still Americans who will insist on owning cars, I can guarantee you of that. But if we do start moving more towards rental vehicle and taxi, again, that's going to be a world where everywhere we go and every trip we take is recorded by something. And if it didn't belong to you, you won't have the ability to control that. So I get to worry about that. Um, I believe we can actually make taxis which are anonymous the way the taxis are today, if we think about it and work hard on it. But right now, nobody, we're a little ways away from that, so no one's going on it. There are some positive and negative consequences for our personal freedom. For example, uh, there's a question about whether we can order a robocar to do something illegal. Um, you know, people ask, uh, you know, can you tell the car to drive off the road or you know, to go 100 miles an hour and so on? Some people would say, no, you shouldn't be allowed to program a car to do that. Um, how many of you saw the movie uh, with Tom Cruise called Minority Report? A number of you see that? So <clears throat> that movie says it's about like, psychics predicting crime, but it's really about robot cars. And in the movie is a scene where Tom Cruise is riding in a robot car, and they, uh, uh, they want to arrest him because it, he's, been, he's uh, uh, been implicated by the psychics that he's going to commit a murder. Uh, and so his car suddenly wakes up and says, you have a new destination. Your new destination is your office. Well, that's a little joke because he's the police captain, and so his office is the police station. His car is being taken back to the police station, and then there's this big long scene where he tries to get out of the car, which is there to have a Tom Cruise action scene. But it's an interesting question. Do we want our cars to do that? Will the police uh, have this power and this ability? Will it change how much they have over our lives? Um, will people have the freedom to tinker with their cars and change and play around with them? Or will people say, you can't do that, that's unsafe? Um, today, we actually give people a lot of freedom to innovate and do strange things with their cars. Frankly, most of the time, that's used to install sound systems, whose purpose I can't quite fathom. Um, but there are also a lot of good things that come out of it. I think we can actually have a new traffic code that's much less complex than the traffic code we have today with just some very simple rules like being safe and not getting in other people's way. Now, there are barriers to this technology coming forward. I talked a bit about the law and the surprising way that the law in the United States has been going positive about that. But there's also just a general fear problem in the public. And the problem is that people don't like being killed by robots. Now, it's just, a, it's just an attribute of, of human beings. Why is that a problem? So the problem is people may be more afraid of being killed by robots than they are of being killed by drunks, which is what's happening right now. Right? They're being killed in large numbers by drunks and, the, and other dri drivers who are careless. Uh, we could see a world where the robots are driving much safer and they're killing a tenth or a hundredth as many people. But because people are so afraid of this concept of being killed by a machine that they would actually push against it even though it was saving lives because you don't see the faces of the people whose lives you saved. Right? They're just happily living their lives, unaware that nothing happened. Um, so, and unfortunately, juries don't see the faces of the people whose lives were saved. They see the face of, a, of someone who was injured. And so it's possible in our American liability system that we could do something which, from a grand view, looks really stupid, banning a technology which is saving immense numbers of lives. But from a close-up view, looks like the right decision. Uh, a lot of people also worry about you know, liability, uh, the companies who make the products uh, are going to be liable for what they do. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but they might be liable for things like punitive damages, which could drive them out of the business. This happened in general aviation. Many of you may know that the companies who made small planes, like Piper and Cessna and so on, simply stopped making planes because the liabilities they were getting in the lawsuits were just too high. They convinced Congress to actually change the liability regulations so that they could make planes again. But the planes they make are very expensive. Uh, because of the history of this. In the old days, of simple uh, planes went away. Um, there are the issues of regulators, uh, and they're frankly being better than I thought. Then there's issues which scare people a lot, like terrorists. There's a problem, which is if you have this level of automated technology, someone could fill one with explosives and say, go and drive to this address and blow yourself up. Not, no longer that pesky need to kill yourself uh, when, when committing such a bombing. Um, this is frightening. Uh, and, but it's also frightening how people might react to it, in the sense that they might, um, you know, the truth is the number of people killed by terrorists is very frightening but very small in our society compared to the number of people who are killed by car accidents. There is also the small matter of programming this. Um, there is still a lot of work to do. What we've, seen is, uh, what we've seen is the technology producing some very impressive prototypes, uh, and there's still a lot more work to do. 
There's also another issue that I have been noticing in all areas of software in the last little while. It's something called the software recall. And that's because with a computer, the company that makes some software actually has the ability to send you automated updates and change the software. And I'm sure you've all seen your software get changed, sometimes even losing features. A uh, classic case was uh, um, on the Kindle book. You've all seen the Kindle from Amazon. Um, there was a company that sold copies of 1984 without the legal rights to do so. And a number of people who bought their copies of 1984 once woke up and uh, discovered a message on their Kindle saying, sorry, uh, we have removed the copy of 1984. It wasn't a legitimately bought copy, and we've refunded your money. Uh, could they have picked a better book to do it to? Um, <laughs> but it tells you what happens with a car when you, have, uh, you find a safety problem. Do you have to now send a message to everyone's car saying, we've discovered a safety problem. Until we have a fix, you must all stop driving? That would obviously interfere with the deployment of this technology. So, okay, now we're, we're going to have to go back to... Every time the screensaver activates, it gets upset. As we say, news. All right. So, on the other hand, let me excite you again by saying that the reason that this technology can come about is because of a principle that we've been taught by computers and the internet. This is a chance for Moore's law to come to transportation. I hope you all know what Moore's law is by this point. The principle that uh, drove computer technology to get cheaper and faster every year, doubling in every 18 months to every 24 months. Well, transportation has never had a law like that. If there were a Moore's Law for transportation, it would say that transportation gets twice as good every 100 years. Right? It's just not the same. New York, they're putting a subway underneath 2nd Avenue right now. It's basically 19th century technology. There's a few extra things on top of it, but it's basically that. If you have the ability for software to control cars and computers to control cars, suddenly a lot about cars and transportation becomes subject to the benefit of Moore's Law. It gets this exponential growth. It gets better every year. It gets new software, new technology, new hardware, and cheaper every year. This has never happened in cars before. It's also going to be good because what we're getting is competing innovators versus those 19th century approaches. We're going to get the things we've seen in the computer industry. What we've got in particular are our favorite people, early adopters. So early adopters are basically stupid people with too much money, right? <laughs> They'll go out and they'll buy a fancy, fancy phone with 3G in it, and six months later, they'll throw it out and buy one with 4G in it for a huge amount of money. Now, they're not really that stupid, uh, because they do want to be ahead of the curve, and, but they drive innovation. They fund the companies that are building new products. They are the people who can buy a product that's bought one-on-one, -on -one compared to you know, things like a, a big transit system, which is only bought by a municipal government administrator. Municipal government administrators are not early adopters. They get fired if they take a risk on something. Their job is to take something that's been tried and true for a long time and work with it. And that's the way that works. But in the internet, in computers, in software, it's been entirely the worst. The early adopters drive the technology, allow competing companies to do all sorts of crazy things. And that's cool. So let's talk about parking. An interesting thing about a robot car is it never truly parks. It does what the law would consider standing, because it's always ready to move. That means you can put a robot car um, in front of a fire hydrant, in front of someone's driveway, all sorts of interesting places where you really wish you could park. They can't, because they'll move out of the way if there's something that needs to go there. Now, that actually means that you can even put the cars on the roads double parked or even triple parked, because you have the ability for them to move as a group and move a gap instantaneously and allow other vehicles to get out. I can talk to you about that in Q&A if you want. But this allows you to build a system where if there are a lot of cars on the road, you don't need any parking on the side of the road because everyone's driving. And in the middle of the day, when not very many people are driving and most cars are sitting around waiting, they double park on the side of the road and there's only a few lanes in the middle now, but you only need that because it's the middle of the day. This, I think, is going to give us the ability to repurpose a lot of the parking that we have in our cities today and literally turn our parking lots into parks. Now, the cynical part of me now says, they'll turn a lot of them into office buildings and other things like that. But some of them are going to get into turn parks, and I'll smile at that part of it. Let's also talk about traffic. So we have seen uh, the possibility that we can get reduced accidents from self-driving cars. And I sort of make a definitional argument about that. And the argument is that I know all the teams who are working on this are very devoted to safety, and they simply are not going to put a product on the road. And for various liability reasons, there's no way they'd put a product on the road until they had already demonstrated it had a better safety record than human drivers. And so, sort of by definition, the product ain't coming out until it does that, and so it will be able to save lives and reduce accidents. But let's look at what clogs up our streets today. 
And the two biggest factors which clog up the streets, one is accidents, and the other is simply putting too many cars on the road, more cars than the road has capacity to handle. Because people all show up and they, you have a, car, a road that can handle 2,000 cars an hour and 3,000 cars show up. So the congestion collapses the, down and we're all in a traffic jam. Um, think about some of the things we can do with vehicles like this. We can take, for example, cars that carry only one person and they can be half the width of a regular car, immediately doubling the capacity of that section of road. We can remove all the parked cars from the road um, when we're talking about rush hour so that you can put all of the space that you've got forward. Um, you can start redirecting streets. So you can say in the morning, all the streets or three quarters of the streets are going downtown. In the afternoon, three quarters of the streets are going outside of town. You can also, to a degree, space the cars more closely together because of the reaction times of the computers. So I have worked out that if you would get all these things together, and this is a old and somewhat futuristic uh, calculation, so take it with a little bit of salt, but that this would allow us to put 15 times as many people on the roads as we do today. And that's pretty huge. Uh, that's more than we need right now. And it also doesn't fall prey to the biggest curse of traffic engineering, which is that if you add road capacity in a city today, it doesn't actually solve your congestion problem. It just moves around what roads people like, and it makes people to build new housing subdivisions to make use of the new roads that you've built. And so the roads clog up again very quickly. But if you have an ability to meter, not just highways, and do they have that here in the district, we have metering lights to get onto the highway? And most places have that now. Um, that's the one success that's happened in highway management. You put the metering lights on, you stop the cars from going on the highway too fast, and they get much less traffic congestion. We'll have that ability across all of our streets. This is admittedly some amount of time away. Um, and that will allow us to make sure that we never let more cars go on the road than we actually have a capacity to handle. And so we very rarely get traffic congestion from both accidents and this and the somewhat irrational behaviors. Uh, robots actually won't have any particular need to slow down and look at the accident on the side of the road. Unfortunately, the the people in them will tell the robot, please slow down. So we, we can't entirely cure that, but there's a lot that can be done. Now let's talk about delivery. Now, one of the things that I find somewhat ironic is that in the United States, we have decided there is one product which we absolutely must be able to get in 30 minutes anywhere we live. <laughs> I'm not sure why this is the most important thing in our lives. I'm not sure why it is the God we must all serve. But for some reason, you can get a pizza anywhere in 30 minutes. But robot delivery is going to mean you can get anything in 30 minutes, pretty, almost anything. And that can have some pretty uh, strong consequences as well. Remember that it was the military that wanted this purpose in the beginning. They wanted delivery. They wanted vehicles which could move stuff around. Um, and that's probably where this will begin. But it eventually will start showing up on our back streets. This can mean, for example, a real change to how retailing works. And you may not like some of these changes because it will mean probably an acceleration of the changes that have taken small stores away and had them been replaced by big box stores. Uh, it may be that the big box stores themselves now find them competing with uh, robot warehouses around towns that can get people anything very inexpensively in a very short amount of time. But it may also mean no need to own big expensive things because you can just get them in a very short amount of time. Imagine taking the garage, which by the way you no longer park a car in, um, and turning it into, uh, how many of you read the Harry Potter books and, and remember this thing called the Room of Requirement? Okay, this is too old a crowd, you didn't all read your Harry Potter. Uh, they're good books, it's okay. Anyway, there was this magical spell room where anything you needed was there when you went into the room. So imagine that your garage is such that you can say, uh, listen, uh, I would like to rent a guest room for a night. And robot shows up with a guest bed and plunks it down, a little bureau and plunks it down. And you have a guest bed for a few days, a guest room for a few days. And then when the guest leaves, if you can get them to leave, um, you say, you know what, I'd like, I, I'd like a treadmill or a weight room in there, or I would like a machine tool or a workshop. Um, this could allow you to get products from warehouses or share with your neighbors. It might change the way that we own property when everything is this mobile. Not just people are going to be this mobile, but things are going to be this mobile. It's also going to change the way airports work, farms, a whole variety of other things. So let's also talk about how cars work themselves, because this is going to change a lot about how we design cars. Uh, first of all, range is not a factor. You don't care about the range of a taxi. All you care about is, will this taxi get me to the place that I have called it to take me to? And you will be sent one that has that range. So today, what we worry about in cars is range in part, particularly electric cars. You're not going to worry about that in these sort of cars. Uh, acceleration today, the ability to go vroom vroom, is the biggest predictor of a price of a car today. 
I mean, you cannot buy a more expensive car without it having a bigger engine in it. Um, this is not a factor you're all that concerned about in a vehicle that you want a comfortable living room sort of ride in as opposed to a, a fun driving room. What you'll do instead is take the living room out to the edge of the mountains and there you'll get into the Ferrari and drive up the side of the mountain in the Ferrari and get the best of both worlds. So it makes, means that cars now start being more about comfort, they be more about a soft ride, you want to be able to share them because I believe that not only will the taxi companies which hire out cars on demand to people, but individuals may decide I'm going to buy a nicer car for me and when I'm not using it I'm going to let it make money for me, hire out itself to a taxi company and deliver people around. I mean, not everyone will do this. Some people will be very keen to keep their own vehicle and never have it be touched by anyone. But other people will be willing to do this. Different constraints on safety. About a third of the weight of a car today is the safety systems to prevent the collisions that we're hoping to prevent in other ways. Sorry, to prevent damage from those collisions, which we want to prevent in other ways. Um, I told you already about small width cars, about single passenger cars. Sleeper cars are also possible and present interesting possibilities for vacation home travel. All of these things could change dramatically the way we make cars. So I am going to finish up by calling for an Apollo-like reserve and use two quotes of my, of my favorite from, from John F. Kennedy. First, that we should do this because it's, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And that this nation should set itself the goal, <laughs> achieving the goal before the next decade of out, of a computer driving a man to lunch at noon and returning him safely to work. <laughs> We're already partway there, as you saw in our video uh, with the guy going to Taco Bell. That wasn't the lunch I dreamed about. Um, but we are already getting close to that goal and getting out into the world. I don't think there are many software projects that offer so much potential, so many human lives, so many trillions of dollars as this, which is why I'm working on it. So now I'm happy to take your questions about the technology. I can't give you deep insights into some of the details of what Google is doing because they're very secretive about some of it and NDAs and so on. Uh, but I'll do my best to help you understand where this is going. Uh, and uh, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Uh, you were first, so we'll start. Uh, I noticed you uh, touched religion in your talk. <laughs> well, you indirectly. During the month of December when there are red and green lights hanging everywhere. <laughs> well, so um, the, way that the, car, the way that the car sees the traffic lights is it knows where they are already. Uh, we build a map of the complete 3D world by driving the street once. Right? And so we know all the geometry of the street and the lanes and so on, where every rock is, where every tree is, every curb, every line on the road, and where the traffic light is. So that when we're driving, we know exactly where the traffic light is with respect to us. And so we do see it in the camera, and we're not looking at the Christmas lights on the side of the road. So it's pretty straightforward. Yes? I was uh, particularly interested in your abstract on your estimate of the number of lives to be saved. Yes. And I was a little bit disappointed when you uh, said, well, GPS wouldn't Mm -hmm. But then going back to that and looking at the technology to essentially use the road sensors and things like that, you know, are we going to have all of this all over the world? In other words, uh, what I'm looking for is, uh, you know, is, is it going to totally do away with the, you know, the, the percentage that's saved by GPS? Or, and, you know, how long will it take? So um, the way the GPS saves lives in the military is, of course, very different. And what I said about GPS in this vehicle is, that it doesn't drive by GPS in the sense of, you know, know where it is with the GPS and know what lane it's in because GPS isn't accurate enough well, to tell you. Right, so it tells it tells you that you're on high you're you're on a particular highway, you know, I'm on highway sixty six at approximately this place. But to know really where you are down to the inch requires this other system. So the GPS gets you going. Yeah. So as to um, the people whose lives are, so uh, when I've quoted the numbers of people who die in car accidents, I don't want to make the claim that every one of them can be saved through this technology. Some of those accidents come about uh, for completely different factors having nothing to do with driver error. And those accidents are harder to prevent with this sort of technology. But at least 90% of them are due to driver error and as such can be helped in this way. We haven't made quite that bold an estimate. We've suggested about 80% <laughs> 
of all fatalities could be pretty readily eliminated with this technology, and then the rest of them can be done with a little harder work. One man was overheard arguing with the GPS unit. <laughs> yes. Because he heard her voice in another video. He was jealous. <laughs> Well, so it, it's interesting. In, in, um, in fiction, um, there have been self-driving cars. So there's Kit, the self-driving car in the Knight Rider TV show, uh, and a few others. And they've always been given, well, very strong personalities because they're sort of Hollywood versions of it. Um, you know, I, there are people who are building these technologies who will try and give them personalities, and maybe there'll be a little bit of jealousy over people who sort of interpret human emotions into them as people have already interpreted those emotions into pets. And I'm sorry, I mean computer pets, robot pets, and... Uh, and other such devices. Um, you know, I, I, ha I can't tell you what personality will end up in the vehicles, but I, I'm sure you'll see a wide range of, uh, of different approaches. Uh, yes? Uh, it was a very heartwarming talk. However, uh, I appeared before the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which examined the electronics in cars. And so I'm very familiar with the report that they've just issued. the one problem they pointed out right away, that problem being security, cyber invasion. Mm -hmm. But they also mentioned the fact that unlike the airline industry, where when drive-by wire came into the airline industry, there were very, very strict requirements on the quality control of all the sensors they used. There were never requirements set by the National Transportation Safety Board. And, and so that's one of the problems, is the requirements on the RF sensors and the shielding. Now, you talk about your car being completely laser-driven. So Mostly laser-driven. I can laser -driven. imagine, but in, in a car like uh, probably a Subaru that I owned that went into unintelligent acceleration, there was no mechanical linkages, okay? And they couldn't diagnose what went wrong with the computer, so they simply gave it back to me and said, it's, we can't guarantee its safety, but we can't find out what's wrong with it. Okay. And, and the whole thing got into such a muddle that I, uh, and obviously, and, and in, into most of the cars now that are completely drive by wire, there are at least more than 60 inputs which go into the central electronic control module. That's true. No, and, so the. So, I disagree. If you b want to claim that the systems are perfect, that would be foolish. All right? <laughs> yeah. No, but, but I don't think you want to or aim for that claim. Um, the safety record actually of drive by wire systems is quite good. Um, and in addition, the systems, uh, the safety systems, in particular the collision uh, warning systems, the, the automatic braking systems and so on, now are ascribed by the insurance industry as, save, as reducing accidents by 25%, the ones that are already in cars today. Now, you may point out your Subaru had a strange acceleration. Now, Toyota had a, a lot of bad press about that, which turned out to, on investigation, be found to be not Toyota's responsibility. However, the safety record... So the systems are not going to be perfect. And you are bringing up this issue of people not like being killed by robots, right? Which is that if, if we have, and we will have, it would be foolish to suggest the systems are going to be so good that there will not be problems caused by them, that there will not be accidents. The test that society has to make is, is it overall overwhelmingly good in particular? Is it saving a lot of lives? Now the fact that it's, if you want to say the technology can only come out when it's perfect, when you can find no flaw in the electronics, then I think that would be an error, to, to stop and delay a technology because you have that level of perfection necessary. Now, the, the car, as it turns out, is the second most dangerous consumer product that we allow to be sold. All right? To make it more dangerous, you'd have to set it on fire and breathe it into your lungs, which is the most dangerous consumer product <laughs> that we allow to be sold. We are not talking about a very high bar here, fortunately. All right? We want to make that system safer. 
Will, will people make it perfect? They will not. Can they make it safer? I believe yes. And I believe they won't release it onto the road until they are convinced, both because of liability issues they have to worry about and the laws and the safety regulations that come from the federal and state regulators, that they won't do it until they really believe that they have made it safer. If they wait until it's perfect, if they wait until no one will ever find a problem, then a lot of people will die if you, if you wait that long. That's, that's my view on it. Um, who's, I haven't been tracking who's had their hands up uh, super long, but let's go to the back a little bit further. And uh, No, you can go. You don't have to look at people behind you. They're, they're pleasant people, but you get to... Sometimes. Now, uh, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, when I still work there, uh, told me they done it. Yeah, actually, you need, you need more than different general GPS for that. You need a carrier phase alignment, which is very good. It's not found in ordinary consumers. So we have the best GPSs that we can buy in our system just because they're prototypes and why not spend a ton of money on them, and they ain't that accurate. Um, in, not all the time. Not that you would drive and trust your life to one. Um, but that's okay because the laser is that accurate, and we do trust our lives to it. Um, the woman at the back, in the middle there, you go. Um, I was wondering, you said that the cars don't communicate that much, but will they communicate some in the sense that you said, for instance, that you could drive closer because of the action time to know if the other car is an automated car or not, and would it adapt to that, knowing whether or not the other car has the same technology? So it turns out for that case, you don't need to, right? I mean, all you need to know is that you're automated. Hopefully you know that. And... So you judge how far behind can I follow behind a vehicle because if it starts braking, how quickly will I see that and how quickly will I react? Uh, and then you can judge your, your distance based on also road conditions. Is it slippery or is it dry and so on? You can make that judgment without any knowledge of the other vehicle. Now, if the other vehicle is going to communicate with you and tell you when it's stopping even before you could perceive that, you could narrow the gap a little bit. So the reason I'm less excited by communication between cars, and there are other people who are much more excited about it than I am, but the reason I'm less excited is, um, is a chicken and egg problem, which is that the first car on the road hasn't got anyone to talk to. It's very lonely. Right? And so you can't solve that problem first. Right? You've, you've got to make the car, that first car has got to get on the road and do everything that you have to do without anyone to talk to. And eventually, you'll get a critical mass of vehicles on the road, and you'll find that you can get benefits from the communication. But that comes later. It doesn't come first. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I think you have been up for a while. I, I should have someone who's like... Two questions. What about uh, human override? And <laughs> under what conditions are you going to allow it? And won't this likely improve your odds of uh, that problem of having humans killed by robots if the human can robot can override stupidity in the robot? And the second question, isn't it, isn't it at all useful to imagine active navigation aids embedded in the road system in addition to the lasers, which might be fooled by various fog conditions or other backscatter or something like that? Couldn't active road uh, navigation aids be of some use to them? Two good questions, and I'm not saying that in the way people usually say two good questions to mean, boy, what stupid questions. Um, it turns out that the, uh, to, to get to the last one first, because I remember that one much better, um, it turns out that uh, putting, st I believe that changing the infrastructure is very much the wrong way to go about it. It's not that there aren't wonderful things you could imagine doing if you had better infrastructure. The very first experiments in this uh, included things like a special highway in San Diego where they did put little magnets in the road. And there are a number of, of sort of semi-autonomous car projects in the world that have had this with changed infrastructure. But then you get a vehicle that can only go where this changed infrastructure is present. And that's not near... Um, well, if... Well, so, okay, so you're willing to drive unsafely on this road and more safely on the other road. I mean, ideally, you want to get the, the best you can get everywhere. Um, we, we take the impression that you cannot... Trying to change the infrastructure is a very slow process. It's a long process. Internet and software people, which is where I come from and where these teams come from, um, they're much used to the fact that you have an idea, you implement it, you're testing it you know, in a few days, as opposed to you're going to put this infrastructure out. So if it appears through the laborious process by which roads are changed and lanes are added and so on, then great. Um, but you don't depend on it, you don't plan for it, you hope that maybe you can get it. It's the same thing with the intercar communication. So now the first question again was very briefly. 
Human override. Oh, yeah, so uh, the vehicles that uh, we're building, that everyone's building, uh, all are very, you just touch, grab the wheel and you're in charge, or the brakes or the gas. In fact, the law in Nevada actually requires that, that the vehicle will hand over control as soon as someone uh, okay. takes over. Hmm? Well, so the steering wheel in, in the cars that we modify today is still mechanically linked. It is not drive by wire. Instead, there is a electric steering motor that provides power steering assist in the stock version of the vehicle. Right now, we've been working with Toyota cars like the Prius and the hybrid Lexus that's available. Um, and so many cars have this electric steering motor, and so we use the electric steering motor to steer the, steer the vehicle. But there's still a mechanical linkage. You, you, um, I mean, I think you could even fight the. I think you're stronger than the motor if you really push your truck. So our vehicle does have our, our vehicle does have exactly that a big red button. It is red, um, and and it will completely disable the system. Um, you know what it'll look like in the final vehicle. I don't know, but you you actually have a physical linkage. Your steering or sorry, your gas and your brake in any hybrid car today has been drive by wire for some time. That's already the case. Um, we are using those systems. So. That, that fits in just fine. Um, you know, someday there might be a vehicle that literally doesn't have a steering wheel, uh, but that's only after, obviously, people felt they had enough evidence and safety to, uh, in the safety to, to make that vehicle go out. I, I think that's sooner than you think. I mean, the truth is, when I started doing these talks um, five years ago, about four years ago, and people would come in and say, you are just absolutely crazy. We're not going to see this in my lifetime. And I would say, well, I'm sorry you're going to die so young. Uh, <laughs> But the truth is, even in my most optimistic projections, I did not think there would be a licensed robotic car on the road in the state of Nevada in spring of 2012, and that has happened. Things, it is the gambling state, but the other states are all going for it. <laughs> now, you guys are going up and down. How much time do you want to spend on Q&A? All right, okay. You're, yeah, it's just how you look sometimes. All right. Um, uh, okay, so who's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's go more to the back. John, go ahead. So the government's not thinking very much about that, but the insurance companies certainly are. Um, the car companies are mostly saying, how can we make sure we're not liable? That's their, their normal job. Um, so a lot of people ask about this. So they say, you know, oh, who's liable in a crash? Is it the driver? Is it the company that built the software, the car? I actually find that to be a, a surprisingly uninteresting question, uh, in the sense that today, when there's a car crash, it's paid for in one of two ways. Either you have insurance that the driver bought, uh, which uh, then covers the cost of a crash that they caused. Or there was a fault in the car, like a tire blew out or you know, brakes failed or something, in which case the car company pays for the damages using their insurance, um, and they raise the price of the car so that the driver ends up paying. So it's always the driver owner who pays for the cost of an accident, no matter how the liability flows, no matter how the insurance flows. And the insurance companies even know that it's always them who end up being involved, because they insure the car companies as well as the individual drivers. So the big message is this, if you can make vehicles safer, if you can reduce the total number of accidents, then the cost of insurance will go down and there'll be fewer claims and everyone is happy. Uh, if you get huge punitive damages, that's not true. So that's why this is a, not that exciting a question in the sense of it's, it's mostly going to be a positive thing and things are going to go down. Now we get to the wonders of, in particular, California. California, not its laws, but its constitution, thanks to the ballot initiative process that happens in California, um, cannot give you much cheaper insurance because you have a safer car. You're, you're right about that. Very few people know that, actually. You've been studying ahead. Um, and it's because it was done by ballot initiative, the, the legislature actually does not have the ready power to override it. So indeed, you won't get much cheaper insurance in California and a few other places from this to begin with. I think once it becomes inherently obviously stupid, maybe it will be fixed, but it takes a lot of inherently obvious stupidity to fix uh, ballot initiatives um, so far. Yes? So, so let's uh, if you're talking about the early adoption policy, how many foolish people do you need to, uh, to start this process? How much would these fools have to pay for this project to take place? So, um, you know, I, I can't tell you uh, what sort of uh, price point, you know, because Google doesn't even have... Uh, Google's a weird company, right? It, it, the, we are willing to just sort of say, let's do something because it's cool, 
and it probably will make money. Right? So uh, mo not every company works that way. There's just a big barrel of money in the, in the central cafeteria, and you just take money out of the barrel when you need it. Um, so not quite like that. Oh, no, no. Well, a study was done by J.D. Power, released actually two weeks ago, uh, where they asked 37% uh, of people said they would like to buy a self-driving car. When they put a price of 3000 on it, uh, the number dropped to 20%, so it's not everyone who's ready to put a lot of money down on it. Um, the first ones will definitely, uh, I'm going to cost more than $3,000. That's just the way first products are. I mean, 3000 above the price of a regular car. But this is what our friend Moore's Law and Volume do. With computers and electronics, anything that people want to buy in volume that's based on silicon processes, uh, it comes down in price really fast. You, you can almost guarantee it. I mean, it's, it, no one actually knows how Moore's Law works. It's a different new technology every time. But like the character in the movie Shakespeare in Love, somehow it works out. It's a mystery. Um, it's, not quite that, it's not quite that simple, but uh, we're going to see the price come down. So yes, those early adopters, uh, expect them to pay. But, you know, look, take the Tesla, right? Tesla cost $140,000. They had people lining up to buy them. There's plenty of people ready to get. I mean, this is, and this is something, this is not just another car. In fact, I go out and say that not the first ones, but the later ones, the ones that can do with the stuff I talked about, the parking, the picking you up, all that stuff, and that's still a few years away. I say this is not a car. I say this is the thing that comes after the car. We don't have a word for it yet. The horse was replaced by the car. And initially, we called the car the horseless carriage because we couldn't figure out a word for it. And we eventually called it the auto or the car. Um, this is the thing that comes after the car. And the whole price decision about it is going to be very different from the price decision that we put on traditional autos. All right. Uh, I just wondered, a car looks like a certain way, but with the whole new technology, maybe these future cars won't look anything like <coughs> cars we have today. Maybe they'll have roller bearings under them or instead of wheels. Or... I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows why? Well, so the interesting potential for that is if you start building a car industry that's a little more modular, uh, which is more a province of having electric cars actually than it is of having self-driving cars, just because uh, the physical design of electric cars is much simpler. You don't have to have this big drivetrain and differentials and all these things that are in traditional cars, if you want to like make a four-motor electric car in particular, you just have to have four motors in the corners, and everything else is just a flat platform that lets you play those kind of games. But yeah, there have been people, uh, I've got some links to them on, so I have a website about this, robocars.com, uh, and then a blog associated with it, and uh, it would take you a while to go through all the blog postings, but you'll see posts to people who've designed you know, full living rooms on wheels with couches, and um, all sorts of stuff that they imagine might be the future of this. And indeed, let the, um, let the designer's imagination run wild, absolutely. Uh, I think that'll be great. Let's go further back again, because we always ignore you people back there. That's your price for paying for sitting back there. Um, all right, uh, yeah, the, the man who has even less hair than me. Uh. Um, I, 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 there's several thoughts I had as you were talking. I was thinking of that guy, but go ahead. Well, so uh, I'm not too worried about that because this is uh, basically 900 millimeter, uh, 900 nanometer infrared light. Uh, it's it's and it's uh, eye safe. Uh, it doesn't. First of all, it travels very quickly, uh, and it meets the, the sort of level one eye safe regulations. Um, so, will that does that mean that people still won't fear it? No, there are people who still won't fear it. But it, it's it's really almost the same as physical light. It's it's just infrared light. Um, there are also um, a number of lasers being developed which use 1.5 micron light, 1500 nanometer light. So it turns out that at that frequency it's harder to build a receiver for it, it's, it's more expensive. But the eye cannot focus that light, it doesn't, doesn't focus it, so it's much safer for you. You can actually beam much more power uh, uh, at that wavelength. And so that allows you to see further, which is one of the limitations of the, uh, the, the infrared, the, the near infrared light, which is that you, there's a limit on how far you want to go. It's one of the reasons you have radar in addition because radar, um, you've got a great deal more range. So, um, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of lasers in the world these days, and there's a lot of experience with eye safety and lasers, and, you know, I don't think we saw a giant pushback against DVD players because of the fear of the laser. Uh, a little bit, maybe, but I'm, I'm, I won't say that's, com you know, that's uh, uh, something no one will bring up, but I think it's not going to be a big issue. But, you know, there are agencies which certify the eye safety of laser devices, and hopefully they will be uh, happy with what they see with these and, and, and pronounce that they're safe to be out there in the world and doing this. All right, now you can, you can go. Actually, oddly enough, I was going to ask one further. Okay. And, Yeah. And that's kind of mad. You, you alluded to that also. People are a lot more scared of radiation than they are of like chemical poison, much more common, much more widespread. And people are much more like uh, scared of like train wrecks or car wrecks, even though millions more. It's a stretch to call 900 nanometer light radiation. I mean, it's, it is radiation, but it's. Planes and trains, people are much more frightened of that, even though car wrecks kill a lot more. But I was wondering, the, um, there's a lot of factors in driving. People probably want to get there, but they also they like that kind of being in the zone, feeling it. Which is dangerous because people do get into self driving and they, they zone out. But just another piece of thing, people really like being in control. Just like people, when you're riding a horse or riding a motorcycle, it's stronger. But people really like that feeling of being in, in control. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people do, some people don't. I guess the question is, how big a factor do you think that that is in, in driving? How many people are like not going to want? Oh, there's going to be lots of people who. Uh, I mean, I I could show it to you, but uh, during the Super Bowl, Dodge made a couple of ads uh, where they, uh, you know, they sell muscle cars and they wanted to put this image that, you know, we have this muscle car. And the idea that, that uh, computers would drive cars is, is so crazy. They actually did the ad uh, where they had, um, the guy gets into his car and there's a, a robot sitting in the front of the car. And the robot says, I'm the GGL 4000. I don't know what company they're referring to with that. Um, and I, I, I will make your driving enjoyable. Please get in the passenger side. And the guy rips the robot's head off and drives the car. So. <laughs> Dodge is not the first company you will see a self-driving car from. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that forecast. But, sure. I mean, no, we're not anywhere near talking about telling people you can't drive if you feel like driving. I think that in the decades out future, we'll start seeing that because just like eventually we got lawsuits where there wasn't an airbag in the car and the company was sued saying, how dare you not put in the airbag, this person died because you didn't have an airbag or you didn't have the safety feature. And we might eventually see a lawsuit where a company is sued saying, because you didn't have the autonomous driving system, um, this person died. And, you know, the reverse of the lawsuit I talked about. That could happen, uh, but again, decades down the road. And, but until that, I think people are going to be ready to drive. And of course, some will and some will not. And I don't, I, I'm all for people choosing whether they want to own a car or whether they want to hire a taxi. But if you think about it, go to Manhattan and you'll find lots of red-blooded Americans who have very happily given up control of driving. They, they haven't given up being able to yell at the cab driver, um, <laughs> but they have given up control of driving, and they don't make a second thought of it. And people from California who grew up in Los Angeles move to Manhattan, and they just immediately adapt to the way it is there. Yeah, no, sure. In fact, a surprising statistic is that Kids are getting their driver's license much less uh, at age 16. When I was younger, it was not uncommon to make an appointment at the, uh, for driving test on your 16th birthday. Um, uh, and now there are people waiting 17, 18, uh, quite frequently to get, to get a driver's license. It's surprising. Um, all right, we're, we're favoring the back for a little while here. Yeah, so um, as I say, in the prototype stage that the technology is, this is not a problem which has you know, been common. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak to anything about here's what people are doing or what they're planning to do. I can talk about that just from a, uh, an abstract concept, which is um, I believe that we'll probably end up using, nobody's using them yet, but thermal cameras, which can actually see the temperature of things uh, as well as uh, you know, the, the visible light that you see, the emitted temperature, so that makes it much easier to tell things. There already you find these in some cars in, in, um, for their pedestrian avoidance system. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of deer strikes. There's two million uh, accidents with deer every year in the United States, and you think that's, there's only 12 million accidents with people. So the number of deer strikes is, is rather large. The score for the cars is much higher than the score for the deer right now, although it's, the deer are winning some of them. Um, 
so that, but that's why we don't see a lot of, of uh, the insurance companies care a lot of it because they pay for the, the replaced bumpers and grills, uh, but they don't have the medical issue with, with deer strikes. But yeah, that's, that's a problem. Frankly, people are pretty bad at this one already. So the bar is, uh, is fortunately not set entirely high. Um, I've, I have a blog post about this very topic about just all kinds of different ways you could look for deer. Um, one that's kind of interesting about the way our laser works is that we have this complete map of the street. We know where every tree is, and we know where every bump and rock and everything is. So anything that shows up that's not on our 3D model of the world is something that wasn't there before. It's something new. And um, although that, you have to get a little closer to it. You, it's not in time for a 70 mile an hour reaction with the current ones. It may get better in the future. But this, this is a start. The thermal sensors are another start. Um, for a joke, I imagine that we could um, uh, fire a little plastic BB pellet at the deer and make it startle and go off the road, but then it was pointed out arming the robots might not be the best thing to do first off. <laughs> um, so, so probably not going to have that. And then I came up with, the, with, 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 with what must be, some people think is the craziest suggestion. No, the, first, the one I just said is the craziest. The second craziest, um, which is you turn off the headlights because the robot doesn't use the headlights. They're only there for the... Uh, the people's comfort, and then the deer won't stand staring at you. Um, so, I don't know, I think there's a bunch of things we could do with the deer, uh, but I will also say that it's just not one of the, you know, people are mostly focusing on urban streets right now and, and, and highways without the deer. Okay, we're going to go back to the middle of the room now. You were there. So, uh, you, I think you just said that the laser has a little bit of a problem uh, at 70 or some certain speed, but I think one of the um, selling points is with our super efficient engines is getting on the highway and going 120. Um, you, know, you can do that in this state? Not, no, not yet. I'm not in the state, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if, if, if this technology that you presented here is limited in its speed, which I think you were just saying, and also is there, is there plans on working on that process? So the radar actually sees very far. And uh, it's just not as good and as 3D and accurate a sensor as the laser is. Um, there are ways to make radar that does ha do have that resolution. They require uh, what's called ultra-wideband, uh, really heavy amounts of bandwidth. It's not currently legal under FCC regulations. It would be kind of interesting if there were a safety application and, and it was possible to do that. Um, but there are a lot of... Uh, uh, I have a little dark secret for you. When human beings are driving 120 miles an hour, they're driving way beyond their own reaction time as well. <laughs> Uh, but in fact, the radar can see many hundreds of meters out, actually, uh, and uh, the laser doesn't. The laser sees about 100 meters, um, and so you do have to combine the two right now to go at highway speeds. So, all right, someone else in the middle, you. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the singularity emergency? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, uh, also after the fact, if you'd like, uh, um, uh, Catherine is here, who was a curriculum director there at Singularity University. Um, so this is a new school that was started in about 2009. Um, devoted to uh, teaching about really rapidly changing technology. Technology like this, things that are driven by Moore's Law and computers, biotechnology, neuroscience, robotics, AI, energy, polit uh, you know, uh, the law in, as regards to these things, medicine, uh, and as I, computers and networks, so I do. Did I miss anybody? Um, I, I said energy. I said energy. Um, so anyway, these technologies are changing really quickly, and uh, we built a school to try and teach all of them simultaneously. Uh, to give you a chance to experience them all from, from experts around the world. Um, and we bring in 80 grad students during the summer. Uh, they come from all over the world, from about 35 different countries. I don't know, this year's class is a similar number of countries. So they come from all over the world. Um, they range in ages from people who just, just completed a master's or a doctorate uh, to people who've gone out and started a company and come back, and the average age is just a little under 30. Uh, we give them these lectures from various people in all of these different subject areas. And then the last three weeks, we challenged them to come up with plans, obviously not whole companies and, and products, but with, with a plan to help improve the lives of a billion people using ideas that no one would have thought of because they didn't expect the technology to change so quickly. History seems to be full of people who sort of planned that everything was going to be the same or just going to grow in a linear fashion, and then suddenly everything was ten times more than it was before, and things were turned upside down. So we're trying to help people come to some understanding of that. Uh, occasionally we succeed, uh, not all the time, but uh, it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of cool people. We also do one week long programs at times during the year and we've also been going around the world uh, doing programs and holding contests to bring in students. That's why we have this international class of students. Actually, we just went to Tel Aviv last month, for example, to 
award two scholarships to Israeli students and then into Ramallah to open a scholarship for uh, a Palestinian student, for example, to bring people together and uh, help to learn how the world's going to change, and it's pretty cool. So, um, Okay, well, we're, gonna, we're only going to... I don't know who's had their hand up the longest, but I mean, you, you, you look earnest. Uh, actually, know the guy behind you, sorry. You do look earnest as well. You, <laughs> you're a very earnest gentleman, I'm sure. I've been very impressed for an awfully long time about the fact that everything changes everything. And as I see things change, uh, I, I realize that I just don't have the ability to see all the I was, Join the club. I was a volunteer uh, physician at the uh, DARPA test, so I, I saw that happen, and it occurred to me then that I just couldn't imagine what, what the implications were. So you pointed out amazing implications of all of this. Uh, but on the other hand, everything changes everything. And one of the things I'm wondering about is if people are passive when they're driving, they're not going to get the benefit of, of letting out their aggressions. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard the word benefit in that context. <laughs> So, on the plus side, I'll tell you that my, our, our cousins in the computer graphics industry who make the graphics cards that go into your computer are working very hard to make the blood spattering be more and more realistic <laughs> in every video game that you can purchase. Uh, and they are, in fact, some of the people who are driving Moore's Law. So the counter, I would say, to what you've just said is, again, our good friends from Manhattan and from many European cities who don't drive that much. And I, I don't think there's been any studies showing a higher instance of serial killing among those people as there is among people who do drive. So I, I would like to see some actual research on your assertion before I, I'm going to get too afraid of it. Um, but... Uh, you know, people are going to, in fact, you know, uh, I, in fact, I, for, for fun, I want to do something when we've got the car at this level, which is play video games in the car. And in particular, I want to play a car racing video game <laughs> while I'm in the car and just make sure I'm not connected to the real pedals uh, <laughs> when I start doing that. I think some of the, someone wants to have pedals so they can actually, you know, pedal and generate electricity so that they're getting their exercise in and they don't turn into the Wally. -E. So I'm told we've got room for one more. Who has the best question? Okay, I think you were, you were pretty early on, so we're going to let you... Yes. Gordon Moore, in 1963, came up with Moore's Law, based on three data points. <laughs> yes. That's kind of ridiculous. But in 1997, at the 50th anniversary of the Association for Computing Machinery, he explained <coughs> Moore's Law. And you should know the explanation. He says it's not a law. That's right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> and what happened was... The computer in the silicon industry adopted it and said any company that is behind the curve has to play catch up, anything, anybody that's head, head can relax a little bit. So, in fact, as time went, the industry got closer and closer to the curve prescribed by Moore's Law. Definitely a self fulfilling prophecy, not a law of nature. So, I was going to say any questions or long polemics in the form of a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I am actually going to answer that, because there's, there's even more to Moore's Law than that. It is absolutely true that there's certainly no natural law which said that the technology must go along that curve. Um, but what was interesting was the fact that the market in computer silicon business demanded that products grow that fast. If you offered your customers a computer that was 10% faster, right, they weren't going to buy it. They were going to say, I have money, I'm going to buy your computer when it's twice as fast. And that encouraged investors to build the fabs that could build those chips that had the more transistors. Um, 
the, the knowledge that there was exponential demand allowed people to invest and grow their businesses in this way. Uh, so this is both the market and the orders of Gordon Moore made that happen. You're right that indeed they set it as a target and the company set it as a target and so we've got to go on that. And they've actually in the roadmaps for chips sort of agreed to scale down the target now that it's not going to be at the same pace. Out to, it is going to continue out to about 2021. Um, they're not quite sure about what they're going to do after that, but it's a mystery. Um, but they do believe that it's going to go at about a, 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 a um, doubling every three years rather than every two years at that point. But it's still going to continue that doubling. But you're absolutely right about that. But that doesn't change that all the other technologies that depend on computers have been starting to catch on to this phenomenon. All these revolutions you're seeing in biotech, in medicine, all these other things are coming because computers and informatics are moving into those fields and getting better as time goes on. The sequencing of the human genome, the sequencing cost is going down at a cost better than the exponential curve of Moore's law. Trends that I foresee, um, without saying that there's any certainty, there are things that I haven't explained to you tonight that I don't know that I won't realize uh, until I you know, get home and think about what I spoke about with you tonight. So um, don't say this is the absolute future, but at the same time, anyone who's trying to plan a city or a transportation system and writing 2030 in their transportation plan and assuming it's going to look the same, it'll be light rail and there'll be all that, that person is also making a mistake. It may not come to pass what I have said tonight, um, but I believe that there's going to be massive changes in transportation that were not seen. I think that's a very safe prediction without saying the exact date. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. We, we have a fleet of robots waiting outside the uh, Cosmos Club <laughs> to take you home. These do not use artificial intelligence, they use Iranian intelligence uh, to, uh, to drive, but they're, uh, they are a precursor to what may happen. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's give one, one round of applause to Brad for a very illuminating presentation. Very entertaining as well. That was. I'm here all week.